I am James Swanick, and today we are talking to a lovely woman who is celebrating one year alcohol-free. This is Debbie Oates, who lives in the Lake District in Northern England. She's a Children's Day nursery owner and director. She is the mother to a six-year-old. And just over a year ago, she completed, well, actually, she started, I should say, uh, Project 90. And now we're catching up with her nine months after she started, but one year later being alcohol-free. And we're going to find out how her experience has been, 12 months alcohol-free. Debbie, congratulations, firstly. Thank you very much. Tell us uh, how... How does it feel to be one year alcohol free before I we go back a little bit and share yeah. your, your story? Uh, it's amazing. It's um, it's a life changing decision, really. But it's also that I'm I'm not sitting at home and think, oh God, I really, I really want to drink now. So that is completely gone. You just live. You just learn to live without it, and you're actually happy about it. So uh, my husband uh, stopped almost two years ago in June, we do have sometimes still a little five minutes uh, congratulation pat on our shoulder thing and oh, it's not amazing and uh, well done us. And so we do do that as well to just to cherish it, I think. So, um, but it's amazing. It's like, yeah, it's amazing. It becomes very quickly, very normal. And you don't know how you dealt with alcohol before that. That's a funny thing, I think. Yeah, I don't know how I cope with the stress with my constant hangovers. I don't know how I did that. I mean, I must have done it because obviously I'm still here, but I don't know how I did it. It was funny. Yeah. How do you see or how do you respond or react when you are in the company of others who are drinking socially and, you know, quite happily? What goes through your mind, if anything, uh, in those kind of surroundings? um, Well, Obviously, with the past year being pandemic year, let's put it like that, there weren't many social temptations, let's let's say. And I live in England. The English are known maybe for, you know, being very laissez-faire, let's say, with the alcohol consumption. They like their pop culture. No offense. Um, well, most people are interested because most people ask a bit like in disbelief so why did you do that it's like oh yeah why not you know so it's a it's a it's a question which comes all automatically now um and then first they kind of try a little bit to oh come on it's you know just one it's my birthday or whatever we had a, a staff leaving party the other day well just with colleagues and they brought prosecco in oh come on just have one it's my last day and it's like no i but once they realize that you are sincere about it and that you're not really embarrassed about it anymore, I'm not embarrassed to say, well, no, I, I stopped drinking. They're actually quite inquisitive. They ask you why that is. And why, why did you, you know, and suddenly you realize that they get uh, interested in what made you stop drinking and they, you can see their thought process. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a funny, and then you have actually a really good conversation with it. And people are then very accepting. They don't try to force you anymore or come on just last just one last one or so it just stops there because I think they see that you are quite comfortable with it and quite sincere and then they're just not asking any more awkward questions really and what feedback have you got from people after they realize you're alcohol free or what feedback have you got from people who maybe have noticed a shift in you this past year compared to previous years um well, I think, well, some people say, well, I, I can't stop, uh, you know, um, I'm in complete control. And then I always think to myself, well, I thought I was, but you are not really, are you? So, but I, I, I'm not lecturing anybody. So, because I think it's, a, you, you can't win the argument. It's like convincing someone you have to believe in God now. So you can't win it. So if someone doesn't want to stop drinking, then that's fine, isn't it? Um. Well, I got compliments in regards because I started, I always wanted to do a master's degree, but I never had the time. As you always say, oh, you know, can't, be, can't do it. You know, I'm a mother, I, you know, I can't, I, I own my own business. So I enrolled finally and people said, oh, how are you going to manage? And I said, I don't know. I will find out, you know, um, but I want to do it. And I managed quite well. And I think that feedback is that people 
realize that you are getting things done in a way. So even though they don't, they don't reflect it to alcohol, I think, or I know it's because of that, but I'm not kind of promoting it really. Maybe I should, but I think they are surprised. Oh, well, well done. Oh, you're doing this now. Wow. That's how, how do you fit that in the day? And it's like, in my head, I always think, well, the three hours I was normally sitting in front of the telly or in my, or front of my, you know, having my dinner and drinking my bottle of wine. That's the three hours now, which I have free and can read my things or do my studies or go to bed early and get up early the next morning and do two hours of, you know what I mean? So they don't realize that it has a side effect. And yeah, so I think the feedback is positive, even though not everybody makes a connection to or you stop drinking if you know what I mean so that's only for me so I'm quite proud of that actually because I think well normally I wouldn't have done it yeah so it seems like you've become increasingly productive yeah. uh, as a result of being alcohol free so that's what I'm picking yeah, yeah. yeah. But you have more time I think the biggest thing for me is I mean except of my my parenting as well with my daughter, because she is quite a whirlwind. I mean, I think every six-year-old is anyway, but you always think your child is the unique one. But um, she's quite demanding, which is nice. And I used to just park her in front of the television all the time to just have my hour with my bottle of wine or with my glass of wine or with my beer, which was silly, really. And now I take that hour and actually interact with her and play with her. And so you have much better time with that. But for me, it's the time. It's time. You have more time. Even if you go to bed early, which is like 10 o'clock, which is not early, early, but, you know, we normally watch the 10 o'clock news in England and then at 10.30, quarter past 10, we are going to bed. We didn't used to do that. We used to go to bed late, but then obviously when you go to bed late, you're tired in the morning. So now we are getting up at six, but I'm not because I have to get up at six. It's because at six o'clock, I had a really good night's sleep, uh, no hangover, um, no headache, and then you are ready for the day. And that's, hour here and there or two hours here and there it just makes a difference it, it, it accumulates over the week doesn't it even on the weekend it's just amazing how much you get done and you get up early especially with the good weather now it's, it's light in, in, in England we six o'clock the sun is up and it's a bright blue sky day and you automatically wake up with more energy and that's just I think for me the biggest yeah the biggest benefit really time Take us back to a year and a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, what were your daily drinking habits and how did you identify those drinking habits were compromising areas of your life? Uh, well, my drinking habits uh, before I stopped, I mean, it was also, again, lockdown. So they say everybody drank more in lockdown anyway. But um, for me, it was I came home regularly and I was stressed and I had to drink to relieve my stress so sometimes um, I think me and my husband obviously my husband a bit uh, earlier than me but when he was still drinking our habit was really come home first walk was to the fridge bottle of white wine and I loved white wine you know Sauvignon Blanc was my thing and before we did anything else so we didn't you know child walked in straight to the telly we went to the fridge had a bottle of wine or a glass of wine and then the evening started so and that became a habit a really bad habit and um you feel it because i every three days i had to go to the bloody supermarket and buy more wine or every second day so you do feel oh god another one is empty um and the compromise was that most of the nights we went to bed tired and you know hung over or drunk really and then the next day we hung over uh, we didn't really spend the time and we didn't have the patience with my daughter. I mean, every toddler is um, yunking up for bedtime, but you have to kind of stay calm and in the zone to kind of control that behavior. And we couldn't. We just kind of said, all right, OK, well, and then we got grumpy with her. And we, I don't want to say we shouted at her. But we got really annoyed with her because we wanted to go back to our wine. And our evening activity, which wasn't her. So she was not really part of that. So conveniently, when we wanted to have our time for our alcohol, she watched the television. And I think that just that was just awful in a way. When I look back now, I think, oh, my God, we've spent we've wasted so much time, really, spending time with her than you know, just drinking wine. So I think that was really bad kind of 
downhill cycle. And then we argued, me and my husband, we did argue a lot of, as well, because when you are drunk, you don't reason, you don't, or you reason differently. You, And then the next day you woke up and, oh, you think, oh, why did we argue? I, I can't remember. Uh, but then you feel guilty about it and you feel a bit anxious about it. And it's just awkward, isn't it? So that just adds to all the stress. And the funny thing is the next day, it starts all again, isn't it? You do the same thing just to kind of, relieve your stress again so it's a real devil cycle isn't it in a way and I think you only realize that when you go out of it of how it is because when you're in it it's quite it's your routine it's your habit isn't it it's your life so yeah funny thing and so what was the what was the time or the moment or the incident or the accumulation of incidents that led to you First of all, doing the 30-day no alcohol challenge program that I offer and then completing that and then enrolling in the Project 90 experience. So what, what, was, the, what was the catalyst for taking the action? Um, well, I think the worst thing for me is that my husband and I at that stage were at a very difficult moment in our marriage, really. So... Um, and I don't want to say it was the alcohol, but it was many other things. And I think the alcohol was really the trigger for many of our difficulties. And it was at that stage where we, I knew I had to change something. And not only like, all right, I'll, you know, give him a little bit more attention. It was a drastic change, really, and uh, to save the relationship. So I remember that we, um, it was just before lockdown last year, and we have a... Um, a second residence, uh, which is a, a lighthouse, effectively. So we rent it out at the moment so uh, for, for holiday lets. And obviously, with lockdown, nobody was able to um, to rent it. So we stayed there over lockdown, which was amazing. It's an amazing uh, uh, area of England. And um, I sat in the garden. I thought, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Am I going to waste my life and lose my husband? And just, you know, and then and I thought, I need a challenge. I need something to take my mind off myself in a way to just focus on something else for a while and everybody in England I don't know in America but in everyone they did all 30 day challenges in regards to um, exercise or 30 steps a day or whatever and I thought no that's not big enough and then I found your video and I, it's really that random that I thought you know what and then the video gave me made me really think is that maybe the reason? And I know my husband got really angry with me because he stopped so long ago. And he said, oh, you should really stop drinking. I said, no, no, the drinking is not the problem. You are the problem. So, and when I read your 30-day, uh, uh, like the description of it, I thought maybe that's really the reason. Maybe the alcohol is really, yeah, standing in my way of being happy. And that was for me the moment where I thought I'll just have to try it. And I was a bit worried about it because I, you know, I like my white wine. And it's a big change, but I thought I'll just gonna try it for 30 days and see how I feel. And after a short while, obviously, I think halfway through it, I already thought this is different, but good different. Amazing. So you that was halfway through the 30-day challenge. You were yeah. feeling like okay, great. Yeah. And then you completed that. Yeah. Uh, and you felt pretty good, I guess. And yeah, uh, very rested and energetic, and I don't know, little changes already isn't it better sleep so you are you know i mean the the fact of our, our eldest daughter 23 you drink with 23 so obviously she's drinking less actually which is it has a benefit on her as well because she sees how we are now without alcohol that she often sits with us now and i think for my younger daughter it will be completely different because i don't think she will grow up with alcohol which is i think fantastic i think she will you know um we all I know when we are young we all kind of get pissed and be silly and everything but because she's watching us having fun more fun with alcohol and spending more time with us I think it's teaching her a really important life lesson and you know because we used to sit with my eldest daughter we used to sit with her and got drunk with her I mean how awful is that with a 21 year old but wow. you do that sure oh come on have another glass and you know, and then you're silly and then they, they they think it's hilarious. Oh, my parents are, you know, but awful. I mean, when I look back at it, it's like, oh, my God, what, what lesson are we teaching her now? And she's off now with us. And, you know, so she sees a huge difference. And um, so, yeah, so after the 30 days, I knew I didn't want to go back to drinking 
but I also didn't know how I how I how how to do it in a way. You know what I mean? Because I'm the kind of person I like these group calls. I like the support. Um, I thought I need some some something to kind of keep me going a little bit because I know I used to stop. I used to smoke and I stopped smoking and it took me five attempts to stop. And I'm not a very willpower person, so I thought I need that um, security net. My husband didn't. He used just willpower, you know, stop, switch, fine. And then we started to listen to all these people. We um, listened to a podcast, obviously, all, you know, your podcast, other podcasts out there. I don't want to promote any other, but there's like one year no beer, and we and all the people said the same thing. And I just thought, well, I want to be part of that. So for me, the group gave me a lot of exchange that I'm not a weirdo. Because you do have funny thoughts at the beginning, don't you? Ooh, what am I doing if I go to a restaurant and I can't order wine? What am I drinking? You know, um, oh God, will I be strong enough to say no if the waiter says, I have a really nice bottle of red wine for you. And we have an Italian restaurant here and he always has really nice wines. And I said, oh, what will I say to Salvo if he brings a really nice red bottle for me? And I, all these insecurities where you don't, you know, where the temptation might be there and or will I be strong enough to say no in that moment isn't it so yeah so for me then the 90 day challenge was definitely the the, the next step um to, to get where I'm now really yeah and so what was your experience like when you went through that 90 day process and why do you think that was so instrumental in you getting long-term power over alcohol because a lot of folks think that if they do a 30 day no alcohol challenge that all of a sudden they've broken through and everything's fine. And now then they're going to have power over alcohol for the rest of their life, which oh. most, most of the time it doesn't happen. Um, because a lot of people, especially with these dry Januaries, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm going to do dry January. But of course you're just waiting for February 1st to roll around so you can celebrate with a drink and then you just go back to the old habits. So um, what was it about that 90 day process that you went through in 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 project 90 that you think made the 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 fundamental shift in you for it to be a long-term habit and that long-term habit being alcohol free I mean um I think the coaching I didn't manage every week because sometimes it, because of the time difference the group call sometimes were either too early bedtime five-year-old or too late in the middle of the night in the UK so I couldn't join all of the group calls, but the coaching always worked. And that's once a week, isn't it? So, and I had that with Kevin. And uh, sometimes he did upset me, but not by on purpose, but he just challenged and he asked. And then I was, you know, I had to. But Debbie's just, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Debbie's just referring to one of our coaches there when you, when you oh, referenced sorry, yeah. Kevin. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. No, just for context for the listener who maybe doesn't yeah. know what you're referring to, we have coaches who work with our. Uh, work with our clients um, and you were saying that sometimes you felt upset by some of the coaching uh, well I just say that he, he, he puts a mirror on isn't he he reflects what what you maybe don't want to face because I do think as well and I wasn't I mean you don't know it until you've done it how much you use alcohol as an excuse to hide behind it and when people told me this a year ago I thought yeah right I'm not hiding anything and I'm, I, I, I used to be the person who was always in control of alcohol. I didn't drink at home on my own, but I needed it for social confidence and all that. So you are hiding behind it. And I think sometimes you just don't want to hear that that is a weakness, isn't it? And when someone tells you that directly, but not rude, but just directly, and you think, hang on a minute, who are you again? You are kind of feel a bit offended, don't you? So I, there were moments where you just had to like think about it and then think, maybe he's right you know maybe and then you then the thought process starts and I think that's where it digs deeper in where you then really take those moments and and think yeah he, he might he might be on something there and and I think that's where you find your strength to say no I don't want to drink anymore because we had the discussion the other day um, because my eldest daughter asked me, oh, will you ever go back to it? Just for a glass, you know, a nice glass of red wine with your fillet steak. And I thought, you know what? In theory, it sounds fantastic, doesn't it? If you had one glass, but I think I would not be able to, I would not be able to leave it there. Um, 
I think it would then lure me in. You know, you would then, everything you worked for in the last year would then kind of slide away again. You know what I mean? So for me, it's really, no, it's, I said no to it and I don't look back. Um, and I'm glad about it. So I just, it's like someone made the decision. I made the decision and now I don't want to regret that decision. So, and I'm quite happy and I'm happy with it. You know what I mean? I, I can't really explain it any better. Sorry. Does that make any sense? You're doing great. So you don't feel like you're depriving yourself of any enjoyment or pleasure or fun by choosing to be alcohol-free? No, not at all. Yeah, that's an important distinction because a lot of folks feel like giving up alcohol will send them into a prison where they're depriving themselves of life's pleasures. Mm. I can I I, uh, I can I see yeah I can understand I think that was my worry as well last year like what are you going to do and it's a funny thing because um I mean again it, it the year was a funny year so you couldn't maybe socialize as much as you wanted to so that like I said the pressure was maybe less but I know that last summer in England we were less locked down so there were more no freedoms and we have a and the best example I can tell you we have a friend couple and they love to drink, big drinkers. And we always used to go there. We got absolutely leathered with them. We had a good laugh, I must say. And they invited us for dinner. And I said to my husband, what are we going to do with them? You know, so we didn't drink. And it was actually a, a, a really funny thing. But I, for the first time, I was actually, I actually talked to them. And I, I found things which I didn't know about them. And I, I've been knowing them for like over 10 years now. So I should, should be able to say I know them. But I didn't know their family history. So you, you get to know those people suddenly and they drank less as well. So the effect you have on other people is actually starting to take the alcohol away and actually interact with the human you were actually having dinner with rather than only talking about whiskey and wine and being doing silly drinking games. So and then we played charades. So, you know, we, we did we did other things and I think for me that was much more a sophisticating evening because A, I remembered everything, B, I didn't feel rubbish the next day and C, I thought, you know what, you, for me, meeting friends is not only for dinner and drinking. You can do things in the day, you can bond with people differently and I think that comes too short when you only invite them to dinner and it's basically an excuse to get you know get bamboodled really isn't it so now you're starting to actually interact with the humans and maybe join interest together we i with that lady i started boot camp now i hate boot camp by the way it's a gym but it's really good for me and i i don't think i would have done that with her with the drink because all we would have done together is just getting completely pissed and you know that's just the thing isn't it you you bond differently to people so you go you're actually exiting your prison i think you're going out of your prison and you're actually starting to make friends and real friends on real things, not on alcohol. Yeah, real friends on real things and not involving alcohol. Incredible. Uh, sleep is a big thing. How, did your sleep change noticeably? Did your physical health change? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I started, like I said, I started boot camp, which um, I needed to do something. Um, I don't think I would have been able to do boot camp because it's at eight o'clock in the morning before I start work. Again, with a hangover, no chance. I would have probably been sick on their floor every more every week. Um, you lose a lot of weight, don't you? I lost a lot of weight, even though I'm already, I would say, relatively slim. So I'm not big, but you lose all the trouble, the wobble bits, you know, I and that's without any training really that's only by not drinking and I think that's amazing so just by doing that people said oh did you are you on a diet well in a way I am but now I'm just not not drinking because drinking has so much so many calories and you don't realize until you stop drinking of how many calories you're actually able to eat without throwing them away in two glasses of wine which is crazy um so that's better, um, fitter, um, sleep, big thing. Um, I always used to sleep anyway more than my husband, but I think even when you sleep less, you sleep better. So even if you had a late night, last night we went to bed at one for other reasons, but um, still had to get up at six for work. And yeah, I'm a bit tired. Five hours is not really cutting it, but 
you sleep anyway better. So you are, even though you sleep less, you're more rested. You just, you know, you're, yeah, you just, when I used to sleep eight hours drunk, I woke up and I was absolutely knackered in the morning. I was tired. I had a headache. I, everything was foggy. Um, you didn't really concentrate on things as well. And I think in my business, I see that as well, that you are just, you're not waiting two months to do something. You're just doing it right then, right now. And in two months time, you, you have the result already. Whilst two years ago, I would have waited a month because I couldn't really be bothered. And oh, I'll do that tomorrow. You get a bit in your own lazy kind of routine. You're just going through the day as things are occurring, but you're not proactively doing things because you are not well rested really isn't it you're not you're not fit you're not at your highest potential really i think so yeah that's yeah that's probably it and and in terms of your business tell us just a little bit about your children's day nursery uh you're the owner and you're the director and how have you found that experience being alcohol free in in the past year well with children whoever works with children you you can't have a hangover. I mean, you can, but you can't. So, um, well, it just overall, it, it, when you when you own your business, and people might probably relate to this, you always want to change things, and you have really good ideas, and you have you know moments where you think, oh, I want to do this, but they're always on your wish list, and you never have time for them. There are these things which you write on your to do list on number one, and then you never cross them off, isn't it? So I had a list like that. And I always want to do this and the other. Um, the master's degree is one part of it because I want to change the direction of it. But obviously, I need the qualification for it. Without that, I can't do it. Um, and with with that, um, I mean, it's not overnight. It's not a thing, oh, I stop drinking and tomorrow you're making millions more uh, in, in cash. But you are, you are tackling problems early, I think. And you are actually taking your wish list and you think, you know what, okay, let's do this. And then you're just sitting down and you're just doing it. And and you're getting, because you are doing it and people see that you are now really involved in it and you are um, inspired by it. And, and then you start researching it. And then other people, I think they're getting on your train a little bit more. They are kind of, you, they're enthusiastic about it as well. And suddenly you have this movement of, of a certain project, which you always wanted to do. And you always thought, oh God, it's such a big thing. I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that next week. Or let's just let's just finish the term and I'll do it in the new term. So you always have an excuse, don't you? And with that, you just tackle it. And they're not done. And the wish list will probably probably always be there because that's just the way I am. I'm a very ambitious person. But I know now, all right, if I want to do something, I will I I know I have the time to do it really, or at least the energy to do it. And then yeah, and then with that, I think you are starting a bit of a movement within your team as well, and they feel it. Um, yeah, so it's positive, really. Change comes positively, and, and quite naturally, if I may say. So, yeah, so that's yeah. the biggest, um, the biggest, I think, biggest influence. So, and we are really busy now, and things I always wanted to do with social media. So suddenly, you, I don't know, it's maybe also a little bit faith, isn't it? But then suddenly you find the right people, you're talking, they are really inspired. So now we have a really good social media company, which promotes um, uh, Linwood very well um, locally, because obviously our business is very local. Um, and we, we are busy, we busier than ever, really. This is the busiest term. And that might also, of course, be because pandemic, people are going back to work. I appreciate that it's not every not everything is related to that. But I think because of your fresh mind, let's say, and your brain fog, you know, which is gone, I think you are just more open to these kind of changes as well and more, yeah, positive really about it. And I think that only benefits your business, isn't it? So if there was a business owner listening right now. Yeah. And they suspect or they, or deep down they know that their drinking is compromising their business operations, probably compromising their health and relationships, but specifically their business, what advice might you have for them? Uh, stop drinking. Um, um, go for it, I think. Um, it, it's, it, it can only bring positive change. It cannot have a negative effect because, because you are more rested, because of all the things I just explained. I think you are just going, as a business owner, you're just going into the day continuously well prepared, even though, you know, even though you, how can I say it? 
even though you're not necessarily working more or harder, you're working at the same level, but because you are more in the room, maybe, or in the, zo in the zone, you just, it has a bigger effect on, on your business, really. So, and I think with staff, and I, I, have, I have 19 staff to manage, and staff management is really hard. I find it very hard anyway. Some people might not. But it's, um, you have to be consistent with staff. Um, and you can't just say, oh, today I can't be asked, really, sorry. Can't be bothered, really, to um, tell them off for something or encourage them or, or do that or do the other. You have to stick to your word, don't you? You have to say, no, you have, you have to teach them, train them every day. I have to be there for my staff every day. I have to give them the same answers every day because if you give them one answer one day and another, then they are confused and then they maybe think, oh, she just talks rubbish or she's you know not in the zone, just leave her alone. So it's just consistent that that presence really, isn't it, that you are in charge and you are in control. And I think staff appreciate that. So that's obviously very regional. I don't know, other stuff might be different. But for me, it gave me... Um, confidence of, of of also maybe sometimes um not avoiding conflict you know when you are not really fit you have a really bad hangover and you say, I really have to speak to that staff because she kind of you know made a mistake yesterday but I really can't be bothered with the argument now so I'll do it tomorrow but if you don't tackle that I think staff will either carry the mistake on so they will do the mistake over and over again which is your that it harms your business um, and they won't learn from the mistake. So I think you need to, you know, you need to be in the zone, don't you? You need to address mistakes directly. You need to manage them right then, right there. Another example is we are doing appraisals once a year. And I always hated appraisals because I was never really, you know, you don't have the time to prepare for them. They are hard work, you know. But this time I was really positive about it. And uh, rather than taking a month to do them, I did them all in like 10 days. So I had two a day which are hard work sometimes, but the feedback I got, and because everybody knew that I would not shift those appraisals, I had to do them. Um, suddenly there was this positivity in the, in, the, in the team where they maybe felt listened to and they felt, you know what, she does really care what I think. And she does really look how I work and she gave me good feedback. And because it was immediate and everybody was in the same kind of uh, time frame, um, they were all very positive. And I think that's, also a key of success isn't it if you have motivated happy staff especially where I work then you you bring the, the business forward our parents feel that the head staff are happy and I think that's what you want isn't it you want that kind of positivity going over to your clients and saying oh they are a great company they have really good staff and their customer service is amazing or whatever in our case it's a care and that's the word goes around and suddenly you get more people buying your product or in my case putting their children into my care really and that's what I want isn't it I want more children I want parents to come so it does affect and I wouldn't have and I, I with our with, with the alcohol with the you know with the the tiredness the headaches the the laziness in a way as well the being oh god I groggy feeling exhausted I the, to start it reflects on stuff but the, the management style goes back to them they, they 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 see that even though they can't pinpoint that but yeah they yeah well debbie thank you so much for sharing your incredible journey congratulations on one year yeah, alcohol free it's amazing and uh yeah continued business success continued relationship success and continued uh, health success obviously on this alcohol free yeah. journey that you're on yeah thank you very much Year comes to 2022 then. <laughs> yeah. Now it's going to be, we're going, going for two years alcohol free now, you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Debbie Oates from the Lake District in Northern England, thank you so much for your time. And thank you very much, James. Yeah, absolutely. And to you, the listener. Say hello to everyone. Say hello to Kevin for me and Anton. Yes. Yeah. You want to say hello to the team? Why don't we put you, we'll do a little Marco Polo here. You can send a little message to the Project 90, current Project 90 clients who don't know you. We'll keep recording here for the podcast so, that, so the listener can, can listen in. So we have this little group on Marco Polo, which is yep. a little video messaging group. And uh, if you yeah, want to... Okay. Yeah, I have that. I have that app still. Yeah, let's, let's have you send a little message. I'll, I'll set it up. Here we go. Hello, Project 90 clients. I am live on the podcast right now interviewing... 
Debbie Oates, who is one year alcohol-free today, and Debbie joined Project 90 uh, a year ago, which is incredible. Debbie, any message? Hello, for our, yeah, any message for our existing P90 clients? Oh, you are doing all great. Keep, 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 keep going. Uh, it's completely worth it. Um, it's the best experience ever. Um, you, you all are doing fantastic. However long you are in the journey, the longer you go, the better it gets. Completely worth it. Don't give up. Amazing. Thank you, Debbie. So one year alcohol free today. So there, that was fun. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of folks, a lot of folks who are kind of either on week one or who are on week four or week five or six, they they tell me that they get super inspired when they see someone graduate after 90 days. So, which is why I think our, our program works so well, because, you know, people there who are on their first week are mixing with people who are on day 80 or 85 or, you know, people who've just finished 90 and maybe they're on day, day 120. And so when they see a message like that from you, who's at a year alcohol free, it actually inspires them and, and propels them yeah. forward even more. Yeah, well done. No, that's that's what you need sometimes, isn't it? A little uh, inspiration for that, really, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, Debbie, thank you so much for your time, and uh, no we'll catch you on the next one. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much, James. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking. You can also text the word quit guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word quit guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90, that's one word, project90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? Computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time.